Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This is Penny Pulley, and I am the Membership Services Coordinator, Wisconsin Land and Water. We're going to get started with the additive use for erosion and sediment control in construction, industry, and agriculture. And I would like to introduce our two speakers for today, and they are Jan Kucher and Sarah Yang. And let me tell you a little bit about them and their background. Jan Kucher is the Water Resources Engineer at the Wisconsin DNR. And Jan joined the Wisconsin DNR after 30 years of consulting, engineering, design, and construction experience. He is responsible for the preparation of technical standards and guidance associated with surface water runoff. Jan also reviews customer additive toxicity submittals and performs calculations to arrive at the allowable usage rate for additive products. Sarah Yang is the environmental toxicologist at the Wisconsin DNR. Sarah joined the Wisconsin DNR after earning her Ph.D. in molecular environmental toxicology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She is involved in the development and revision of water quality criteria for the protection of Wisconsin's surface waters. Sarah also addresses questions related to the secondary value calculations and the toxicity of additives. I will now turn the webinar over to Jan and Sarah. Hi, this is Jan, and thank you for uh, attending our webinar today on the additives for land and water application. Uh, we're at the contents page here, and I'll just give you a summary of what we're going to be talking about. The, uh, the purpose, the background for, for these additive uh, technical standards, some key terms, uh, technical standards guidance which have recent, recently been updated, specifically the land applied uh, additive standard 1050 and water applied 1051. Uh, give you a summary, questions, and contact information how to uh, get your questions answered. So we'll go now to the purpose uh, of this uh, of this additive, of I'm sorry, of this webinar, is to provide an outreach summary of Wisconsin DNR's technical standard 1050, as I mentioned, uh, land application of additives for erosion control, and this was updated in December of 2015. Also, technical standard 1051, the water application of additives for sediment control which is also updated in December of 2015. Uh, the goal of these documents is, of course, to protect the aquatic life and surface waters of Wisconsin. Uh, here in this slide, it shows a couple of examples of what can happen if we don't uh, control sedimentation. Uh, the left photo, a typical example of what might happen from a construction site if uh, for example, a uh, erosion control additive isn't used, and the right in a, a river uh, example is where potentially uh, a sedimentation basin or industrial site doesn't use a uh, an additive in in, a, in that basin to uh, knock down the sediment. So, as far as background is concerned, here uh, an additive. Uh, is a term we've we've used to be more all-inclusive of, of polymers and other chemicals used to control sediment and erosion control. So an additive for land or water is important when a product is directly discharged to surface water without receiving treatment, or a product used in a treatment process is not expected to be removed by wastewater treatment and may have the potential to be a source of discharge or effluent toxicity. Again, we mentioned the technical standard 1050 for land and 1051 for water. So a couple of key terms used in our, our standards and our guidance are, uh, are the additive, as I've mentioned, uh, uh, a substance, typically a commercial product, potentially be directly discharged to surface waters of the state and could be potentially tox toxic. Now, surface waters of the state uh, refers to the sub-portion of waters of the state that are discharged at the surface. And waters of the state means those portions of Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, within the borders of Wisconsin, and all lakes, bays, rivers, streams, rivers, ponds, wells, and impounding reservoirs, etc. Uh, except those waters which are entirely confined 
and retained completely upon the property of, of a person. And this is from uh, state statutes. Uh, key uh, uh, term is also the LC50 or lethal concentration 50, uh, in which 50% of the exposed organisms are uh, uh, die in a given time period. And this is uh, used in our toxicity testing or bioassay. And then the secondary acute value is a term used in the toxicity test, and it represents a concentration of a substance which ensures adequate protection of a sensitive species of aquatic life to adverse effects from acute, acute exposure of that substance. And then the, uh, the allowable application rate is, uh, is the application rate of an additive that protects aquatic life from adverse effects caused by acute exposure to the additive. And this is a practical um, rate for land is, is uh, expressed in terms of pounds per acre or for water application, pounds per acre foot or pounds per volume, which is uh, pretty well out, uh, out uh, defined and outlined in our guidance for water quality review pr procedures for additives. Okay, the next slide uh, talk about the technical standards and guidance. And if we click on the first one, the technical standard 1050, it takes you to the DNR website. And if you scroll down, Um, get over here to scroll down. Um, you'll get to standard 1050, for example, here for land, land application of additives for erosion control. And this is uh, a useful standard where, for example, contractors are going to be using an, an additive for erosion control to for the uh, chemical to bond to the particles and hold the soil in place until the veg vegetation is established and it is a temporary uh, measure for erosion control. So now we can go back to the uh, standard 1051. Similarly at the uh, DNR website and if you scroll down to sediment control practices find 1051 uh, water application near the bottom here and it's a PDF. Again this uh, technical standard uh, similar to 1051 was updated in December of 2015 and this outlines the uh, criteria for the uh, use of water applied additives as a flocculant or sediment control in ponds. So now if we go back to the third uh, item listed here, and that's the, the guidance, water quality review procedures for additives. And this was updated in uh, April of 2015. And it is located here on the website, the third bullet down here, water quality review procedures. And that should that should open. There we go. Uh, Sarah Yang, our tex toxicologist, and I uh, worked on this. Actually, Sarah did the lion's share. I played the devil's advocate. And uh, what this does is outline the procedures for the uh, the uh, toxicity testing and the bioassays for. Uh, both land and water applied additives, uh, and it's useful for uh, for the applicant and the laboratories to uh, go through and determine what what needs to be done on on uh, the additive review. Um, a key item of this is in append Appendix C. There's a worksheet. Uh, it's called the Additive Review Worksheet. Um, and this is a, a Word document with fillable areas, and here you can see that uh, Appendix C. Um, we will be getting this on the website. Uh, I don't believe it's on there yet, but 
an applicant will be able to pick this up and fill this in from the bioassay, and a laboratory would fill this out. Uh, in the meantime, if that can't be found on the website, uh, email myself uh, at uh, the, the DNR, uh, Jan Kucher, and uh, at the tail end of the uh, webinar here, we'll have my contact information. So when we go into standard 1050 here, uh, big picture summary is, and, and this is all, all from the standard, paraphrasing, paraphrasing here to make life a little bit easier. Uh, can we use the term additive, uh, which is all inclusive, and it includes polymers, such as polyacrylamide or PAM. For land, it can be soluble or non-soluble used to bond a soil for erosion. Non-soluble example might be uh, wood chips with a, a chemical additive. And uh, these are used prior to vegetation establishment, and they're not considered permanent. They're ideal for a uh, construction site. You have difficulty getting uh, vegetation established in September, October, or something. You need something to bond the soil uh, when you have rains without the vegetation a good common sense solution. Uh, updated in fall of 2015. And a key point here is for the DNR reviews uh, these additives when there's potential for runoff to surface waters of the state without treatment. Uh, and as I noted earlier, previous slide, the, the, the toxicity testing follows the water quality procedure, water quality review procedures for additives. Uh, so when we have the land application, application criteria, as outlined in 1050, is to use the manufacturer's recommend recommended instructions. And the DNR uses a, an equation here to calculate the allowable application rate in pounds per acre for uh, spreading the product. And we use a secondary acute value from, from the toxicity uh, divided by 1.4 to, to calculate that number. Uh, one caution is mixing the product in the powder form uh, can be hazardous to respir respiratory system. Uh, uh, key consideration is use the product in conjunction with other best management practices, uh, silk pens, silk socks, uh, basins, what have you. Uh, one of the limitations is when using on bare soil to, uh, with, without the seed, uh, don't go steeper than three, a three to one slope. And do not apply uh, these additives to channel bottoms. Uh, it's important to control the safe disposal of unused products uh, without discharging to storm sewers or surface waters in large concentrations, obviously. Uh, and to when the product is used, uh, it's necessary to document uh, the product mixture, date, application rate, and weather. Uh, and the manufacturer uh, will provide uh, product labels, instructions, and the expiration date for the product. So when, uh, as far as land application, uh, we calculate the allowable application rate uh, based on toxicity, which Sarah will explain in more detail later. Uh, once we've established that application rate, for example, for land, it's pounds per acre, the, the DNR issues a letter with the allowable uh, application rates for that particular product. And we do, uh, we do this on a product by product basis, not a site or project. Uh, basis. So once the, the product uh, has an application rate, we, we put that on to, into a table. Uh, I maintain that table. You can contact me uh, uh, for a copy of that. Uh, it's it's uh, a bit more expeditious for me to send it out than to get it on the website. Additionally, uh, my colleague over at the Wisconsin AT, John Rubelein, uh, maintains the, the product applicability list, ap acceptability list, sorry. Uh, just switch over here to the website 
Wisconsin DOE. If you go down to the current erosion PAL, uh, so list of tables here, 20 tables. And uh, example, if you scroll down to 14, it's a bit small, difficult to see, but uh, the DOT lists the product, and these are the these are land pro applied products for erosion. Uh, the, the manufacturer, the product name, and the DOT lists the application rate and the DNR uh, maximum ap application rate from toxicity. Now the DOT looks at this from a performance standpoint as an efficiency of bonding materials. Uh, DNR looks at toxicity, so there's a range there for, for the actual use. Um, just to note, everyone, if you have not already done so, please try to mute your phone if, um, until the question period. You can do that by clicking on the little microphone. If it's green, that means you're not muted, and if it's red, that means you're muted. Thank you. Uh, back to the slide here for land, finishing up the land application. Uh, the tested for erosion control performance, as I, I mentioned, uh, by, by the uh, manufacturer or potentially DOT. Deep can extend the life. A couple important points here for for the product is the anionic or the negative charge are recommended because the cationic will bond to fish gills, fish gills, uh, and it's important to use a 30 foot setback uh, when using anionic polycrylamide near waters of the state. So additive to soil may improve water quality, infiltration, soil fertility, and erosion control. Uh, when we look at considerations uh, for land, additives may be effective in phase construction, uh, stockpiles prior to winter shutdown, as I mentioned earlier, agriculture prior to vegetation. Uh, may not be effective in sandy soils or in snow, obviously uh, large particles or, or frozen. Uh, use of color is effective to make sure there's consistent application. Uh, may need to adjust the mixture depending on the soil and the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, and uh, just a safety consideration is they can slippery uh, when applied. And uh, can reduce the uh, slope, slope stability uh, in some instances. And now I'll take a look at uh, standard 1051 the water application. These parallel fairly closely to the land, uh, except they're soluble added to a pond for clarification. Uh, and again, the DNR will review these when, put to, and when there's potential for surface uh, runoff to surface waters of the state without treatment. Again, they, follow, they go back to the use of the water quality re review procedures for additives guidance for the toxicity related uh, aspects. Uh, and the standard uh, uh, outlines the toxic psychological aspects to protect fish and aquatic organisms. Uh, look at the manufacturer's recommending, recommend, recommended application rate, and uh, the applicant will need to provide the toxicological information for the DNR to calculate the allowable usage rate. Uh, Again, additives should not be applied directly to the waters of the state. Uh, use the manufacturer's instructions. And a key item here is that the allowable application rate uh, in the pond on a volume basis uh, is calculated in pounds per acre foot, uh, which is the secondary acute value from the toxicity times the 1.35 conversion factor. Again, the manufacturer provide the safety data sheet, formally called the material safety data sheet. Uh, similar to land caution and mixing the powder uh, in relation to the respiratory system. Use products in conjunction with other BMPs and uh, where additives used for temporary sediment control do not remove the structure until water is clear. For example, 
copper dam uh, stream uh, uh, stream construction projects. Application criteria similar to land document the date, rate, weather, application rate in the log, uh, product labels, and uh, application method to provide for uniform application, and uh, the, the the water applica applicate applied product can be applied passively. For example, if there's a single pipe coming into the a pond, it can be dosed mechanically, mixed with the uh, liquid coming in, or uh, with a mechanical mixer in the middle of the pond or, or a strategic location. Again, don't dispose of uh, used products and stormwater structures. Uh, similar to land, don't, uh, we recommend the anionic uh, product and not the cationic. Um, the application rate calculated by the DNR in pounds per acre foot based on the toxicity, which Sarah will talk about shortly. Uh, D, similar, DNR issues a letter with allowable usage application rates. And uh, we maintain a list, uh, specific list of the water supply product uh, usage rates, which can be obtained by uh, calling or emailing me. Important note for both uh, land and water is that the product chemistry changes. Uh, manufacturer needs to resubmit the toxicity information. Uh, in some instances, the, the product chemistry doesn't change, but the company uh, sells that product or that portion of the company, and the name changes. So ideally, the manufacturer should send uh, me a letter to explain that. I can note that in the table, but it's the same product, uh, different uh, different name. Uh, considerations for the water applied product. Uh, again, these are straight from 1051. Uh, product should achieve 95% sediment removal. And, uh, verify that the additive in the pond is not directly discharged to waters of the state. Uh, one way to test the product is with turbid water at 800 Allometric turbidity units, and then with 40, 48 hours, that uh, the fellometric turbidity should be more like 80 ppms. Uh, use the least amount of additive to achieve optimal performance. Uh, again, caution mixing product uh, in the breathing zone for respiratory concerns and, and can also be slippery. Sarah, if you can help me out here. Sure. So now we're going to actually walk through the process that we use when we review the toxicity of an additive. Um, so the process is the same regardless of if it's a water applied or land applied additive. It's um, when we calculate the allowable usage rate is how those two types of products differ. So for um, to have an additive review, we have to have a request made by um, you know an interested party, so the manufacturer, the supplier. Um, a city was ever interested. Um, and then when we receive uh, a review, they are sent to the runoff management water resources engineer, which right now is Jan Kucher. And um, a bunch of information needs to be submitted. So first, we need some general product information. Um, if it's being used in a specific location, then we need the facility name. Um, if not, um, we also need the product trade name and manufacturer, um, the chemical name if that's available, the um, active ingredients, including the CAS number if it's available. So if this is proprietary, that information does not need to be included. But if it's not proprietary, then we would like to have that information. Um, we would also need the product um, dosage rate or appli proposed application rate. Um, and then the toxicity information. So we need uh, official aquatic life toxicity test results for the whole product. Um, we're not looking for just the active ingredients. We need toxicity tests on the whole product because even inactive ingredients can affect the toxicity of the product itself. So um, in that aspect, we need tox to know what the test species was, the test duration, um, how long the test ran for, and then what the endpoint was. 
as well as the actual tax receipt value. That information is typically available on a safety data sheet. We need some additional information um, about the tax receipt test that is not always available on the, tax, the safety data sheet. So we need to know what test method they use. Um, there are EPA approved methods for aquatic tax receipt. Uh, there's also DNR certified labs for toxicity testing, and then there's some other methods. So we prefer, we recommend using an EPA approved method or a Wisconsin certified lab, but if that's not available, it's completely okay as long as some additional information is. Oh. Minimum requirements are always test method exposure format, so <clears throat> were the organisms exposed in right. a Right. renewal, so the water was changed every day or like in a flow through system. Again, please remo uh, please remember to mute your lines if you're uh, just called in. I think there's a way to do that on your phone or on your computer. You can press the red microphone button. Um, we also need to know the control response. So this is the percent of organisms that weren't exposed to the product. How many of those died? Um, this just helps make sure that the data that we're getting is accurate. If a whole bunch of the controls died, we don't really want to use that toxicity information because you could be receiving an application rate that's much lower than, than is necessary. And then um, the test concentration. So um, to help compile this information, we put together a worksheet. Um, and this is being uh, compiled into a, an actual fillable form that will be available on our website. Um, this worksheet provides um, the, a place to just compile all that information for each of the products. And um, the toxicity test, test parameters need to be provided for each organism that's tested. So right now this worksheet is in the um, Water Quality Review Procedures for Additives Guidance Document. It's Appendix C. But um, as I mentioned, it, um, we're actually, we're also making this a fillable form, which will be available on our website shortly. And this doesn't have to be used, but it's just helpful for um, us and for the manufacturers to know the types of information and be able to put it all in one, in one place. So once we have all that information, then we calculate what's known as a secondary acute value. Um, so in a toxicity test, we expose uh, organisms to increasing concentration of a substance, so in this case, the additive. And generally, as the, tax, as the amount of the product increases, so does toxicity. So the more um, product they're exposed to, the less survival there is. From this, we obtain um, what's known as a dose response curve. So on the um, vertical axis is the response in the percent. So in this case, it's mortality. So it, and on the horizontal axis, we have concentration. So as concentration goes up, so does, re so does the response. Um, this is how we attain what is known as an LC50. So we calculate the concentration that causes um, mortality in 50% of the population. So in this, in this example, the concentration is 3. Um, but this is just a general overview of how toxicity tests are performed for aquatic organisms. So once we have um, toxicity test results, we can then calculate that secondary acute value and use that to figure out what the allowable application rate is. So if we have, um, in our example, we have three data from three different test organisms, Daphnia magna, Daphnia pollux, and a fathead minnow. For the two Daphnia species, we have test results from more than one test. So what we do is we take the geometric mean of all available toxicity test re results for a given species, um, and we come up with what's known as a species mean acute value. So that's just um, the mean of whatever is available data for that species. Um, in the case of our fat head minnow, we just had one result, so it's just the mean of that one result. Um, then we calculate what's known as a genus mean acute value. So we take if there's data for more than one species in a genus, so in this case, we have two different species of Daphnia, we take the geometric mean of those values, um, and we're looking at the genus level because we want to make sure that we're protecting the um, ecosystem as a whole. So it's 
um, important to to look at this um, this level of organisms. Then what we do is we take the lowest geometric mean acute value. So in this case, we have two values, 30 for the fathead minnow and then 7.47 for the Daphnia species. So we take the lowest one, which is 7.47. And then we divide that by a safety factor. The safety factor depends on the number of organism classes that there's data for. So um, the more organism classes there are, the lower the safety factor. The required, um, so we're looking for eight different categories of organisms to have the lowest possible safety factor. Now that is very unlikely to um, and expensive to attain for all of these different products. So we um, recommend, you know, the more data that's possible to obtain, the better. But we can do this with a minimum of toxicity data from one um, Daphnian species. So in this case, we have data from a Daphnian species and a fathead minnow. And those are in these two different categories. The, da the Daphnian is in the planktonic crustacean category. And the fathead minnow is in this non-somatic fish categories. So we have two organism classes represented. And our safety factor then is 13. So we divide our um, lowest toxicity value by the safety factor to come up with the, the secondary acute value. And this is just to ensure we're protecting um, the aquatic or organisms in the ecosystem. Um, because we only have data for these two classes of organisms, we have to use a safety factor to, to make sure we're protecting all organisms. So in this case, our secondary acute value is 0.575 milligrams per liter. So the next thing we do is we take that secondary acute value and we use it to derive the allowable application rate for the product. And Dan's going to talk about that a little bit more. So we've, we've gone through the toxicity and then, as Sarah mentioned, we, we have the, uh, <clears throat> the secondary acute value. And I mentioned this earlier, it's, and it's outlined in the, in the two technical standards as well, but the, the allowable application rate for land, for example, is, is pounds on a, on a square acre basis. Uh, and that equals the secondary acute value, uh, milligrams per liter, divided by the pounds per acre, uh, 1.4 milligrams per liter. So you, you end up with the pounds per acre. Uh, and the, the difference here in the water is the secondary acute va value is multiplied by 1.35 uh, pounds per acre foot per milligram per liter uh, to arrive at that pounds per acre foot or volume pounds per volume basis. Uh, so that's that, that's the, the key difference between the two there, and uh, it's identified in the in the technical standards 10, 15, 51. So a, a brief summary here. Uh, we talked uh, briefly about the two technical standards, 1050 for land and 51 for water application. Uh, and the additives used for land, erosion, and water for clarification. Uh, and the products, uh, uh, the additive products need the DNR toxicity information and uh, testing when the product can be discharged to waters of the state without treatment. And uh, this is, it's quite rare not to have uh, these products discharged to surface waters at some point in time. Uh, we mentioned the worksheet, which is Appendix C in the guidance titled Water Quality Review Procedures for Additives. And we'll be working on getting that on the website uh, shortly. Uh, that document is it's a Word document with a fillable uh, areas for EPA test and uh, toxicity information, etc. The streamlines our work and enables us to get you a allowable usage rate, a application rate quickly. Uh, I just want to mention while we're on that, the, the key is not to use a, a neat product in toxicity, uh, but uh, use the whole product as uh, Sarah mentioned with all all uh, substances in it, just as if it is actually spread in the on the land or water. Uh, DNR then calculates the uh, usage and application rate, 
and uh, can I, I keep copies of the latest tables with the allowable uh, usage, usage rates for land and water. And then the applicant's responsibility is to monitor the application of the product and to log the specific uh, usage. And in our next slide, we're uh, open for questions and encourage you to ask uh, anything you can, we can help you with. You can either type your questions into the chat box or you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. If you're like me, I'll think of a question later on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hello, Jan. Yes. I have a question uh, regarding the list of water applied. You said that's not available, but to contact you for uh, the uh, listing? Yes, yes. You can, yeah, yeah. Uh, shoot me an email or call. Shoot me an email or call. Okay, yeah, we've been asked several times for that list, so I will just pass your name and number on to uh, people that uh, want to get that list. Okay. okay. Very good. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Um, we got a question on the chat box. It says, because flocculants are typically ineffective below 50 degrees, do you have any recommendations for products to use for colder water temperatures? Oh. I don't offhand. Uh, yeah. The UNR typically does not endorse um, specific products. I mean, you could look through the product lists that are available and see if any of them would meet that criteria. Yeah, uh, or a, a, a vendor that supplies several products could potentially help you out. Okay, we have another question on the web. What's the cost effectiveness of using, using additives versus more traditional erosion control, such as tea or mulch? Well, I guess you'd have to look at it on a site site-by-site, site-specific basis and the number of acres uh, and the runoff, the runoff distance before it would encounter the best management of the silt fence or the silt sock, uh, and whether you'd want to spend the money to put in a, a basin or a temporary basin and use a flock tool. So uh, hard to answer <clears throat> in one, one easy step here. Um, another one, how do you monitor the usage rate for water application at end of pipe addition, and how to field verify that none is getting to the water of the state? Um, I can take part of that question. So we're not expecting that none of these products are going to make it to the waters of the state. That's actually why we calculate that secondary acute value and get the allowable usage rate because we um, know that some products are going to enter the water um, and the allowable application rate is the concentration that can be applied to the land that will still protect the environment. So um, we don't necessarily need to monitor what's going into the surface water. We just need to make sure that what's being applied to either the um, water or the land, depending on the additive, um, is within that allowable usage uh, application rate um, is equal to or less than that. And that will ensure adequate protection. OK. Um, another question is, how extensive does downstream treatment need to be in order to not need an additive review. Will a basic farm pond work or are you talking about a wastewater treatment plant? So for additive reviews in the context of um, the water applied and land applied additives, we do an additive review for all products. The treatment um, case that I mentioned was for a wastewater treatment plant. Um, so maybe an industry has some sort of on-site treatment that could remove the product. Um, 
So if there's potential for it to enter surface water of the state, some farm ponds are not considered surface waters of the state, so that'd be something to look into on a site-specific basis. But if it has a potential to enter a stream or um, something on that order, then the additive review is necessary. Um, so someone asked, is the Wisconsin DOT PAL list the same as Jan's table? Um, they, they, they will overlap. Uh, there's likely more products on uh, the DNR's uh, land applied table uh, than the DOTs, but uh, I work with John Rublein on that, and uh, uh, I guess between the two of us, we could we could help uh, help on questions on that. Okay, that's all the questions we have online right now. So, um, if you have any other questions, please type them in or let us know. And also, Jan put up our contact information. So, um, if you think of a question later on, you can either call us or email us. Um, Jan is really the go-to person on these technical standards, um, and I help out when we have questions um, specific to toxicity of the products. Um, I, this is Kenny again from Wisconsin Land and Water, and I think we've covered all the questions. Um, again, you can contact them directly if you have any questions, and I would just like to thank everyone for attending today. Um, this is put on partially by the State Interagency Training Committee, SITCOM. So thank you for participating, and have a great day.